1071. The Byzantine it's Empire. Called the Eastern Roman, Roman Empire. Empire. Called themselves Ro the story of the Byzantine Empire in the Crusades is kind of a long and complicated one, but like all good stories I was told as a child, it begins with a crushing military defeat. In 1025, Basil II, also known as Basil the Bulgar Slayer, also known as my celebrity crush, died, leaving a strong and healthy empire in his wake. However, while Basil was a solid 10, all the people that came after him were like, maybe twos in their leadership abilities, not their looks. Why would I be talking about their looks? Don't look at me, I'm not attracted to dead emperors. By 1054, after almost 30 years of incompetent leadership, the Muslims in the East were starting to look kinda scary again, so the Byzantine Emperor, Constantine IX, invited the Pope to send some representatives over so that they could talk about a military alliance. Unluckily for everyone involved, the Pope chose a cardinal named Humbert who hated Greeks to be in charge of the whole thing, and after getting put on house arrest, by the Patriarch of Constantinople who hated Westerners, they both ended up excommunicating each other and the Christian church was officially split in two, so I guess you could call that a success. Just a few years later though, a new threat to the empire emerged in the form of the Seljuk Turks. These Central Asian nomads swept through the divided Muslim world and conquered city after city. Next on their list? Constantinople. Naturally, the current emperor, Romanus IV, had his own to-do list, which included getting his homework done, taking deep breaths when he felt sad, and not letting Constantinople fall to the Turks. Sadly for him, though, when he met his Turkish foes at Manzikert in the summer of 1071, things didn't really work out the way he planned. CHARGE! You know, I feel like that cannot be a good sign. While Byzantine losses from the Battle of Manzikert were really not that heavy, the resulting political shenanigans resulted in Asia Minor being completely overrun by the Turks, but then their leader died and they all started fighting each other. Back in Constantinople, after some heated political discussions and civil wars, a new emperor named Alexios Komnenos took over and immediately had to deal with a Norman invasion, but after that was done, he decided that it would probably be a good idea to start reconquering the empire. However, in order to do that, he needed soldiers, and the Byzantines didn't really have a whole lot of those just lying around. So in 1095, with no other options, Alexios wrote a letter to the Pope requesting military assistance. Now, the Byzantines really only wanted some money and maybe a few thousand European knights. However, Pope Urban II was currently in a power dispute with another guy who thought that he was the Pope, so when he received the letter, he had another idea. <clears throat> Alright everybody, raise your hand if you have ever sinned. Okay, Robert, I literally saw you kill a guy last Tuesday. Come on, show me those hands, people. Yep, there, okay, yeah, see, there we go, okay. Now, what if I told you that all of your sins could magically disappear? Ooh, all you have to do is reconquer the Holy Land. You'd get to go to heaven, I'd get recognized as a legitimate pope, I mean I would love go God more. The crowd went wild. This was an absolute bargain. I mean, if you told me that after I'd spent my entire adult life slaughtering people and pooping in the street that I could just make it all go away, I'd have probably changed my Instagram bio to a Bible verse before you'd even finish the sentence. Unfortunately, some people thought that it was too good of a deal to wait for, and this guy named Peter the Hermit gathered up a bunch of untrained peasants and started marching right towards the Byzantine Empire. Hey, just curious, how many of you guys are in that city? Um, it's just me today. How many of us are there? It's like 40,000, I think. That many? Really? Is that enough to take the city? I say we attack him. Yeah, I mean, I haven't eaten in a while. As you might expect, the Byzantines had noticed that one of their cities had been burned down by a bunch of homeless people, so the local governor gathered as many troops as he could and fortified himself in the city of Nish. 
When the peasant crusaders got there, the governor told them that they had to leave and go to Constantinople right away, which the peasants agreed to. However, on their way out, a few crusaders got into a dispute with some locals. One thing led to another, the Byzantine garrison got sent out, and whoops, looks like 10,000 peasants are dead. By the time Peter the Hermit and his remaining crusaders got to Constantinople, Alexios was less than thrilled with the West's response to his plea. All he'd wanted were some mercenaries and some money, and all he'd gotten were sacks cities and German farmers. So when Peter offered to leave Constantinople and start fighting the Turks right away, Alexios ferried them across to Asia Minor, where they were immediately ambushed and massacred by the Turks. So all in all, I'd say things are off to a pretty good start. Hey guys, there's nothing left. The poor people took every- wait. Who are they? Contrary to popular belief, the Crusaders didn't start out as one big army. They were actually five separate forces, including one led by the Normans, who Alexios had just kicked out of Greece, so that was kinda awkward. Each time a crusading army arrived in Constantinople, Alexios would take the leader aside and make them swear that they would return any territory they conquered back to the Byzantines. Unfortunately for Alexios, a lot of the Crusaders turned out to be egotistical maniacs, so you can probably imagine how those conversations went. First of all, you're not even the king of France. Second of all, how dare you? I literally control your food supply. What do you mean you can wait me out? I don't care that your father was emotionally unavailable for you as a child. You still can't keep Antioch. Swear it. Kiss my feet. <laughs> okay, no, not like that. It's just a sign of submission. I, I heard it as I said it. You know, immature people like you are the reason we're in this mess in the first place. And he somehow got an oath from every single one of them. Mostly. Kinda. Once Alexios had ferried all of the crusaders across the Bosphorus, he sent his own army along with them to retake the city of Nicaea. Situated on a lake and surrounded by thick walls, the crusaders and Byzantines were unable to completely cut off the city's supplies until Alexios ordered the construction of several ships that blocked off the lake from the defenders. Now, Nicaea was a Byzantine Christian city, and Alexios didn't want the crusaders sacking it like they seemed to do with everything else. So his generals worked out a scheme with the city's garrison where, in exchange for not killing them, the Turks would pretend to lose to the Byzantines and surrender to them. After securing the city without the Crusaders even really noticing, the Byzantines then shut the gate and told the Crusaders that they weren't allowed in because they'd lost sacking privileges. This made the Crusaders a little grumpy, so Alexios took them all aside again and made them reaffirm their pledge to return Byzantine territory. Mostly. Kinda. For logistical reasons, the army then split into three parts. The Byzantines, Normans, and Flemish led the advance into Anatolia, the rest of the Crusaders followed behind them, and another Byzantine army led by Alexios split off to reconquer the rest of Western Asia Minor. By the time the Christian forces got to Antioch, there wasn't much left of the Byzantine army. Since they'd been reoccupying so many cities, they'd had to leave behind a ton of garrisons, which quickly depleted their numbers. The Crusaders had also suffered some losses from battles and attrition. The Byzantine commander, Tetikaos, told the Crusaders that it would probably be a good idea to secure the surrounding countryside and wait for Alexios to come and bolster their numbers. However, the Crusaders thought that this sounded lame and figured that it would be a good plan to just surround the city right away. I mean, after all, that seems reasonable. Man, I'd eat just about anything right now. So, things weren't going that great. During this time, Tetikaos left the siege either to gather more supplies or because he thought the Crusaders were going to kill him. It depends on which source you believe, but tomato tomato. After the Byzantines left, word reached the Crusaders that a big Turkish relief force was coming. So after making contact with a Christian inside Antioch, the Crusaders were able to sneak inside and take the city. However, once that Turkish army arrived, the Crusaders found themselves a little bit, uh, stuck. 
Meanwhile, Alexios was slowly marching his army across Anatolia to help the Crusaders and occupy Antioch, but on the way, he ran into some Crusader deserters who told him that a huge Turkish army had arrived and that Antioch had probably already fallen. If this was the case, Alexios would basically be committing suicide if he just kept marching his army towards the Turkish death stack, so he turned around and went back to Constantinople. However, in the meantime, the Crusaders had beaten back the Turks somehow and occupied Antioch for themselves. They figured that since Alexios hadn't shown up to help them, their promises to return all the territory they captured didn't apply anymore, which is legally questionable, but I mean, hey, what are you gonna do? Alexios didn't find out about this until July of 1098, about a month after the Crusaders' victory. At this point, Alexios was already back in Constantinople and he had just disbanded his army, so he wasn't really in a position to waltz across Anatolia and occupy Antioch. The crusade was basically over for him. Regardless, he did send an embassy to Antioch to politely ask the crusaders to return it, to which they replied, Comni no, it's more like Comni no. <laughs> uh, no, I won't give it back. The embassy then continued down the coast to the city of Arqua, where the rest of the crusaders were, to politely ask them for all the other cities back, to which they replied, yes. Really? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, get out of my tent. So how did the First Crusade go for the Byzantines? Well, the empire went from looking like this, to looking like this, which is definitely an improvement. They didn't take back all of Anatolia or the Levant, but they did get some Christian buffer states to the south, which soaked up a lot of Muslim attention for the next few hundred years. They also got their capital sack- wait, no, I'm sorry, that's a spoiler. So, maybe you know this already, but the First Crusade was actually just the start of one of the most divisive series in cinematic history that continues to polarize critics today. If you want to learn more about the Third Crusade, the 1189 smash hit starring Saladin and Richard the Lionheart, look no further than Hikmah History's video on the topic. He makes tons of videos on Islamic history, so you can also learn all about the expanded universe. Link is in the description.